So it's kind of sounded like the the Mookie War rig was sort of like a step on your way to the NSW rig, like evolutionary. It it, it was. I mean, it came the NSW rig came ten years forward. Um, Mike Satello, um, Steinbrecher, some of them dudes, seven, Team Seven, Fox Trot Platoon, some guys from Team Three, um, John Kelly, uh, a bunch of those platoons and sister platoons came in, and st we were working a lot with um, Satello and uh, Steinbrecher and some of those other dudes, uh, Mikey Monsoor's platoon, they were in Ramadi when um, Mikey um, died. And um, they just, you know, they came back and they'd, they'd learned a lot of stuff after that and a lot of things changed um, after that, all that went down in Ramadi. So the whole way they were running things changed and they came in and Steinbrecher was an officer and uh, so he's not only talking to the fight, he has to talk to air assets as well. So now we've got to have two embitters. We still got to have stuff to plug holes with. We still got to have shit to make holes. And um, we just started layering things. Like we weren't, we hadn't done any rigs with internal mags. We'd kind of stayed away from that. It was, um, so we, we made a rig with that, um, layered some stuff on top of it, came out with the saw pouches because they, they've still got to carry, like whether you're carrying a belted fed gun or not, you're still carrying bullets for the belt fed gun. And even if they weren't, if they weren't carrying that, we could still use that so they could use it for site for surveillance exploitation, stuff that they need to take away from the target they can put that in there to secure those items. The breacher can pull out of there and load a shotgun with the shells. They can put bangs in there for banging or grenades if they need to. Um, we had smokes on the bottom of the pouches. We've got the utility pockets, which is it's a Mark 46, 48 pouch. So it'll hold 5.56 or 7.62 belted ammo in those pouches. We put an adapter on there so it'll hold the 200 round saw boxes. The Velcro wouldn't touch, but we had a quick fit adapter where we could fast text that in. If you're not using that shit, we can strip those buckles off and just rip Velcro. They had pass throughs through the top like our spent mag pouches have. And that's where they're, you know, just using, if you're not using it for belt ammo, you can use it for whatever. You can pass your hand through there. Behind there is a, a deal that's a, a slot pocket and we had Velcro in there and you could, we could raise the Velcro limiter strap. So nowadays you can put like a little embitter radio, a little, well, a little family channel radio. We can strip all that shit out and run an embitter with a booster and a battery pack on there. Or we can put our tear off, our, our pull out med trays will fit in there. But back then they were taking Kydex holsters, mostly Blade Tech holsters at the time, still running 226s. Wrap hook Velcro, adhesive Velcro around there. We could put it down inside because the whole slot's Velcro lined and we can mate that in there. Had three grommets so we can run a bungee retention like our mag pouches have and we can run it canted or to this, where they can put it wherever they want it at really. So he's got a gun on the rig, he's got a radio on the rig, He's got all the ammo. He's got six up here. We made them so the whole AK is a byproduct. They'll fit. They'll fit five, five, six mags also. Um, for every platoon, we did two or three NSW rigs that held M14 mags for their 308 guns. Um, and then uh, smokes on the bottom. On the the actual NSW rigs on the back of the box had two frags on there also. The ones that we sell to the civilians and we make to this day don't they now all have pals so if you need grenades you can add grenades to them the boxes were all pals out the boxes have kydex in the face so we can put pistol mags on there and still hold shape to the boxes the box is semi-rigid and then on the front you just had pals so we made the nsw admin panel so that they at the time they were using 76 garmin 76 gps's put a piece of velcro on the back this folded forward, there's a Kydex board inside so it held its shape. So they had their GPS there, they had a light, they had a clear window that was in there, they had a clear window for their charts, and the ones we made for the for the actual platoons folded up so they could have maps, and they could write on them with China markers on the plastic and not mark up the maps, they could move them as they needed to. And then typically you had two more pals, so you could put, a, you could put another mag pouch there, or a radio or whatever you needed to depending on what you're doing at the time. And that was the NSW rig, and it holds a, it holds a shitload of stuff. And it just, like, when Ben fucking, when we had that bit rig for Ben, like, Ben probably couldn't wear that rig without armor. I mean, it was big. Yes. Ben, and Ben was fucking big then. Like, Ben was fucking big and in shape and fucking fast. But he couldn't wear that fucking rig without armor because he's too big. So nowadays, we have the NSW rig. It's 22 inches wide. Carries, carries just as much shit. We just figured out more ways to do it. It's layered out a little bit. So remember you're saying there's a sort of special design of the mag pouches to make access to your spare mags a lot faster than on some of the other? Well, there's no lids to them. We were running bungee retention. So we've done something for a long time, which you'll, you'll hear, you hear a lot of talk about it. 
and it's mostly negative talk and it's from dudes that have never used it. Our mag pouches are lined inside front and back with loop Velcro so that you can take a, a one inch adhesive dot of Velcro and put it on your mag either side doesn't matter. We put them on both sides of our mag pouch, the soft Velcro, so whether you index your mags left or you index your mags right, it doesn't matter where that is. So you don't have to worry what side the dot's on them because we give you Velcro on both sides. If you were to put hook Velcro on both sides of your mag, it's too much retention. That one inch Velcro retention, it's a bitch to get those mags out. So we put it on both sides of the mag pouches. And it'll carry AK or M4, they're open top, and we give you bungee. We were one of the first companies, too, that took the bungee and split our bungee, um, our pull tabs, at an angle, and we specifically did that so that it will retain AK mags. Most of your companies just run front to back. Ours running two pieces up through the, through the pull and then into the back. We've got two pieces. It's more labor, but it, it perfectly holds an AK mag, whereas everybody else, you had to rig that shit up and try to get it, and it was always sliding off AK mags. So from there forward, everything we built was for AK mags because as a byproduct, it will work for M4 mags just as well. There, we, from, from 10 years back, everything we've built is around AK mags because it works for M4 mags. You build shit for M4 mags, it usually doesn't work for AKs. You gotta, you gotta you know, work with it. So that's, that was really that. There wasn't really anything special to it. We've done it for, we've done the Velcro retention shit for 20 years almost. One of the things that why John Willis has always been the first, and you know, every as I was saying to to you out there, everything you see made of nylon is a shitty copy of what he he makes. He makes something six weeks later, some moron in Tijuana is kicking it out for half the price and one tenth of the quality and zero of the ingenuity, and that happened because throughout the war. Um, we would be out there using his shit or other people's <clears throat> shit or whatever, and we'd get on the email and say, this is what's happening with my shit. And it, it was like a, like the Skunk Works or, or James Bond calling, you, you, you just send him your problem, and he's up here. And, and it wasn't all this big fucking money fest going on here. He was in there with the fucking one song machine, cutting, measuring, that's not going to work, that's not going to work. He listened to what the operator wanted, he didn't give him something say, this is what you need, which fails every time. But in every industry, it's what actually happens to, to us. And that's why, uh, well, that, the quality of the workmanship, the ingenuity behind it, and, and your charming disposition, um, that's why it was so fucking awesome and continues to be. And everything else is just not relevant. It's just not relevant. I don't fucking deal with it at all. There, there, are some comp there are companies out there doing cool shit. There's companies out there that have qu high quality. You go back 20 years ago, though, and there weren't all those companies out there. You know, we were, we were just starting. You had Eagle. You had Blackhawk copying what Eagle did. You had London Bridge on the East Coast, which is pretty much just a cut and sew shop for Dev Group. Yep. You can buy London Bridge shit. You'll pay three times what, what Dev Group pays for it. Like, they will sell it to you. But you will buy a product on par with another company, you'll pay three times as much for it. You fast forward now, ATK owns, you know, fucking everybody. I don't believe they don't own London Bridge, but like they own Blackhawk, they own Eagle, they own all the armor companies. It's it's all under the same roof. So it was nothing to get a, a satellite, you know, a SATCOM phone call from one of these guys. And back then there were no photos. We still do that today. We still get that shit, but we actually get photos. We get photos from from dudes in the middle of fucking nowhere, or we'll get we'll get video messaging and you'll just hear fucking gunfire going off and shit in the distance. So I mean, we're still doing the same thing we're doing. Um, we're just doing it on a on a smaller scale. We do it with a, a more finite and um, just higher echelon of of people that we're operating with. We you know the attitude and shit. You know we're fast to tell a dude to fuck off if you're telling me you're deploying or whatever. The first, we'll reply politely with, hey, send me, you know, email me the same thing from an appropriate email address. It should say dot socom or dot mil dot socom. It should say something like that behind it. If you got, and then we'll look at your shit too. That's another one that guys are famous for. Hey, I've got, I've got missions coming up in two weeks. No, motherfucker, you don't. You, you don't. And especially you ordered, you know, a cash print micro rig or it's got fucking toxic green thread in it. Like, 
okay, you got missions coming up. Email me from a dot socom address or whatever it is. We'll bend over fucking backwards. I'll have my fucking crew in here on Saturday and Sunday, and we'll stay here till midnight till your shit's done. We do it all the time. You can ask fucking any employees. They work all day Saturday. It's nothing to have ladies in here sewing on Sunday. It's nothing to be in here myself doing it. Colin works till fucking midnight all the fucking time. So does Lance to get those people their shit. But if you bullshit us, we'll make an example of you. I mean, we have a lot of fun with it. So, but we still we still do the real shit. Platoons still cut orders and send two dudes out here with a piece of equipment they need pouches for. We stand right here at these tables on the weekend and build that shit. It still happens. There's dudes in, in this room right now in this group that we build shit for that still fucking go to Afghanistan and back and still fucking work with those fucking top tier asset guys. We work with those dudes. It, we still build that shit. So when a guy, you know, I'll test this for you, you know, we kind of just laugh about it. I mean, when you're working with the best, how is some fucking dude who, you know, just showed up going to test anything for you? So, yeah, we're a little cocky. We're the fucking best at what we do. We don't build the most. We build the fucking best. We get paid appropriate for it. And um, we just have fun. I don't ever get up in the morning and go, fuck, I got to go to work. Like, I love what I do. My family's around me. You know, my friends are around me. You know, we're growing the business, not... Like, just because the business gets bigger, we don't make more money necessarily. I'm growing the business so that I can employ more people that I've done business with over the last 20 years. Lance Manning. I knew him back from fucking battalion reconnaissance when he fucking was putting kids through, you know, rip and shit. And uh, he works here now. Fucking, we hired that dude. Um, Eli Miller. You know, Eli's coming to work here full time. I do. Running our medical program and our, our medical design stuff. Like, all of our med shit came from, you know, him plugging holes and seeing friends blown up in fucking Iraq for you know, four deployments. We hired that dude because I want him fucking near me. He, I care about what he's doing. That's why we're growing the business right now. That's why we're fucking, you know, getting bigger and doing bigger things so that I can provide jobs for those dudes. I mean, that's one thing I've noticed about both you and James. It seems like there's a very strong focus on developing the community and almost to the point where that's on par, if not more so than the actual business interests. A, l a lot of it is. Um, man, if you don't like James, it's because you don't know James. Everything you hear, anytime you see some dude talking shit about James and you point blank him, have you ever met him? Have you ever looked him in the eyes? Fucking 99% of them haven't. The other fucking 1% is because he hurt their ego somehow. And maybe, maybe he just fucking was a dick to him, whatever it is. But I mean, you've seen as well as I've seen James put a trailer on the back of a truck and drive three states over to pick up a student whose car broke down. He already had his money. It's non-refundable. He gained nothing by doing that financially. He does it all the time. He's at Toys for Tots at this moment, packing boxes. So, like that, that's a fucking normal thing. Like, like the shit, the cool guy shit you see James do, there's fucking half of his life is fucking not as cool shit, doing shit for other people and getting nothing for it. James does way more shit for other people than I do. I should be doing more. Like he makes me feel like I fucking fell short. But James does a lot of shit for a lot of people. I mean, you guys are all here right now. Yeah, they're literally Barbie dolls on the gear shop walls when you walk in. Yeah, James ain't playing with us. Yeah, yeah that's true. How did how did you and James meet? James up. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Student of the Gun Homeroom. Make sure that you're listening to the radio show each and every week, watching the TV show, and that you download the mobile app. Hey, it's free, right? You can get it at the Google Play Store or your iTunes Store. And please leave your comments below.